let's talk about hunting, harvesting, and being human. We are lucky enough to have the conversation with Father Vitali. What is hunting? Well, hunting, whatever else is true, is a predatory act. It's to engage in the wild community on the wild community's terms. It's not, it's not farming. It's not agriculture where the farmer is in control of the animal. Uh, let's assume beef, okay, or cattle, whatever you want, sheep, where they're, they're fenced in and they're essentially part of a controlled environment. Hunting, in a sense, eliminates the fence and it hunts the animal, it pursues the animal on the animal's terms. And so the hunter doesn't control the animal, the hunter engages the animal uh, in terms of the wildness of the animal itself, okay? So the hunter pursues the animal on the animal's terms within the animal community, within the wild community. So in a way it's atavistic, it returns to a very early human experience when the hunter and the, uh, the, the human community were identical with the pursuit of food in the conditions of the wild community. So hunting recaptures that fundamental relationship to the wild community in the pursuit of food normally. Can you tell us about the differences between hunting for meat, trophy hunting, and sport hunting? Well, hunting for food is, is an indisputably good thing. I mean, that's natural, okay? It's obviously, in fact, it's better than going to the store because you have a natural relationship to the animal's life you've taken. Where, there's a word they call it, they use it sport hunting, okay? That's the wrong word used, okay? It is not a sport. Football is a sport. Basketball is a sport. Hunting is not a sport. Because a sport has the connotation of parity of competition. There is no parity between the hunter and the animal. It's a predatory act. It's not, a, a, it's not when they say, well, f I know because I wrote about fair hunting and fair chase. I wrote for the Boone and Crockett Club for that. I think I consider myself one of the best authorities in the country on fair chase. It hasn't to do with fairness to the animal where you'd say we were equal. I gave it a good chance. It has to do with the character of the hunter. Okay, not about the animal. It's not fair in that sense because it's not a game. It's not a sport. It's not a game. It's a, it's a predatory act governed by a series of complex moral laws and rules in order to protect the species, if nothing else, and not to dehumanize the hunter. Okay, so the when we exercise fair chase, we also uh, uh, restrict the gun used or what's used in order to enhance the predatory act uh, from a human point of view. So you have, we have capability to massive firepower, but then you lose the intimacy of the hunter with the hunted. You have to handicap yourself in such a manner to get A, a clean kill, and at the same time, it's a profoundly human act. It's not a sport. It's a predatory act with con considerable constraints to bring out the intimacy between the hunter and the hunted, okay? You decrease that, you lose it. Then I've got questions about it. The same with trophy hunting. That's another bad word. Trophy hunting, if the guy's out to get the biggest rack he can get, uh, there's something vile about that, really vile, okay? But to hunt and challenge oneself to, to go after only um, the, the premier member of that, that species, is, which would demand a great deal from you, a lot more of the human effort. That's what, so the rack doesn't prove, isn't braggable at all. It's not the point of it. It's the exercise of your virtues, which signifies themselves in the pursuit of an elusive animal that is extremely elusive, or it wouldn't have that rack, okay? So it is not a case of just sticking something on the wall. Right up on that wall there. That's a doe. I got her in Kentucky. These are does up here. They're as invaluable and as, as, as important to me as that buck over there and that large buck over there. And that's a nice buck over there if you want to measure the points, okay? And then shoot him for his points. I'm not hunting for the meat. As a hunter, hunting for the meat qua meat. I'm hunting for the predatory experience. I want to enter into that continuum. And I challenge myself by not shooting everything I see but challenge myself to go after and then to make the choice. So last year when I was out, I had a buck in front of me. 
I don't know, six, I think it was around six point. It was a nice buck. And uh, I looked at him and I said, oh, come on. Okay? And then his four girlfriends showed up and I had tags for all. I said, no, I'll go make babies. I don't want to take your life. Okay? I don't want to do it. You're not offering it to me and I'm not going to force it. There's an interesting thing in there. To me, that every animal on my wall, every one of these, uh, every fish, is not a trophy but a sacrament of the life they gave me. You know what that means? They're a symbol. But they are, they are a symbol that makes present to me not just the hunt, but the animal whose life I've taken. And in some instances, what the occasion of the hunt is. Right there, that buck over there. Right there. That's not a brag of a buck at all, whatever you want to call it. It was a vintage, vintage of Kentucky deer at the time because the racks were small. Okay, now they're mega bucks. Okay, you know that. My friend Bill Ritchie died. This guy right here. In 19, this was 86. He died right in November, right before the deer season. And that buck came flying off a hillside, full tilt buggy, furiously running. And I, t I was sitting on my rear end, and he came flying ass by me, and I took a swing. Boom, I shoot, and I, boom, a second shot. I didn't know if I got him or not. He didn't run three feet past me, past the gully after I fired. He was right there. And I said, that's my Bill Ritchie. I said, Bill gave me the deer. Every time I look at that deer, I see Bill Ritchie. That's a true story. Can hunting teach us to be human? There is something also to this that the hunter exchanges with the, with the hunted, with the prey. There's an intimacy that you just don't get out of the grocery store. Whoever had an intimate relationship with a piece of steak? And you don't. There's, there are, there's a factory in between. All right, so grocery store eating is essentially artificial because there's, there's no relationship between, between the hunter or the person eating, the killing of the animal, the animal itself and the animal's relationship. You see this in experienced hunters, okay, where they, there's a personified, there is a personal interaction with the animal hunted, so that one gets the experience that the hunt, that the animal hunted gives its life as a gift to the hunter. You never get that out of cattle in a barn, okay? This is not it, and it's because I think there is an entrance into the animal's life. Um, it's hard to explain it. There was a friend of mine's. Uh, he was the head of the park service up in Alaska. He captured it. Well, I used to go out with him up in the bush up in Alaska in the, in the interior. And he told me about a time he was hunting um, moose. He had a moose tag, a, uh, a uh, cow tag, okay? And the season, was, it was the opening day of the season. And you could only hunt the, the cow on one side of the road. The dividing line in the two areas where they were huntable was on the north side of the road. On the south side of the road, it was illegal. Okay, you had to have a boundary. <laughs> so he's Tom was a hell of a hunter. So he's out there, and the cow, the cow moose, it stays on the on the south side. It would never cross over the road. All he had was ten feet to the right, and Tom would have shot it, but he wouldn't shoot it as I'm in. And the way he put it was so poetically elegant and true. He said she wouldn't give herself to me. Isn't that a great line? She wouldn't give herself to me. See, that's what the hunt. When the hell's the last time you went into the grocery store and said that that piece of steak gave itself to me? It did. You're removed aesthetically and intimately from the food you're eating. The hunter's not directly involved. Directly involved in the taking of a life that has been given to it. Any hunter worth their salt knows that. They know that. You see the bear over here. It took five years for me to get her, and I was up in northern Ontario. Five years, because I could, if there was, if they said the average was one in, you get one, 20% of the time you'd get a bear, I fulfilled that. It. it took me five years to get one bear. And I got her, and my experience with that was incredible satisfaction. And I said, finally, finally it's over. I can't say I was enjoying it with anything but, okay? And I said, hell, I'll never go back. I'll never do this again. Not because I felt sorry for the bear, but I couldn't stand the black flies and all that. You just have to experience it, okay? And I thought, you know, it took five years. I'm going to mount her walking just the way I saw her. And hence, this is the bear. The next night, 
two nights later, that was a Sunday night, I had another week, the whole week to go, and I thought, wow, what am I going to do in a bear camp? And for 25 bucks or 35 Canadian bucks, you could get another tag. And I said to, the, to Bill Richie, the guy right here, this picture right here, my sweatshirt, okay? I said, hey, Bill, maybe I'll go out again. I get another tag. And he said to me, yeah, but you got to hunt the same bait, because he had 15 other hunters. I knew I went, it was going to take me another five years, so what the hell? I said, sure, good, I'm good, I'm game. So I went. I'm sitting there about 9 o'clock at night, across the field in front of me, and the bait's about 100 yards from me, 50, 80 yards. Here comes a bear. Comes out straight out, and he looks at me. Gets up on his haunches and stares at me. Well, I have my rifle's under my poncho. I'm sitting there, I said, what? So I didn't move, and he looks at me. He must have circled me because he knew I was there. He got my scent, and I wasn't moving. So he didn't like what he smelled, so he went back in. Well, now I took my rifle and put it up. On, yeah, I'm in a blind. Okay, put it up. He comes out again, looks at me, turns around, goes back in. Comes out again, looks at me. If you're looking at a clock, he first came out at 5 after, then he came out at 5 up, then he came out at quarter up, okay? Comes in about 20 yards, gets up on a deadfall, looks at me, says, the hell with this guy. Off he goes, and finally he goes down the road. It's a dirt road, a logging road. And I thought, man, I'm... my heart was coming out of my mouth at this point. I said, oh my God, I'll be back. This is now almost 10 o'clock at night. It's almost dark. I'm sitting there. He walked right in front of me, 30, 40 yard shot. I shot him and I killed him instantly, knocked him right over. That was a different experience. They didn't have that sense of final completion, like I finally, finally, finally got one. I walked up to him, and I had a sense of gratitude to him. And so what I experienced was not my power over him, but the fact he gave me his life. I never lost that. In fact, I mounted his head downstairs, okay? But that was the difference between the first and the second bear. The first bear was a, a case of final satisfaction. I finally, finally succeeded. I was overwhelmed. I was caught by, finally, after five years of frustration. But not the second bear. That was pure gratitude. You got to see it. You see, I think hunting is so important, so is fishing, and because I believe that uh, uh, we have to recover that atavistic relationship to the natural community. We're too over over urbanized, too much so, and it dehumanizes us. You see, and I'm grateful for the state parks. I'm grateful for all that stuff, but you can't just visit them. You have to enter them. I was telling my class today. I think I was telling my class. I don't know what I'm talking about. But I said I'm not a hiker. I I can. If somebody said to me, "Let's go on a hike," why? I don't want to. Put a rifle in my hand, and now we go. Because I, my mind is, I'm no longer hiking, I'm hunting, even though I have no intention to pull the trigger. But once that rifle is in my hand or a shotgun in my hand, I convert from walking in the woods to hunting. Every sense of me takes on a new form. I'm alert to sounds and smells that I would not be alert to if I was just walking, okay? I wouldn't be chatting, I'd be quiet, okay? And I would be listening to the woods, and the woods will tell you who's there. I'll give you another story, Tom Lyfes' story about Alaska. This is a true story. This is the difference between taking a walk. He, we were just scouting. He was scouting for moose, okay? He had a moose tag. I had my rifle with me. I, didn't, I don't know if I had a caribou tag. I might have, okay? But we were walking in the White Mountains. We were walking along in, in a fairly cleared area, cleared by forest fire, not by any human being, okay? So it was a new growth. And he paused and he looked over at me and said, Ted, do you smell that? And what the hell? I'm not. And I said, oh yeah. He said, that's a dead moose. There's a moose down. And I, he, my, he's a member of Boone and Crockett, like myself, teases me about it. And I said, does this cause for concern? He said, yeah, it's a grizzly bear on it. Yeah, you better be ready. Ah, I slipped the rifle off. My God, I went from predator to prey, just like that. And I remember, and this you'll appreciate, I turned my scope down to one. And I had my finger, I didn't have it, I didn't have the safety, the safety was still on, but I had my thumb on it. And I had the rifle ready to go. And my quiet prayer was, dear God, please don't let me miss, please don't let me miss, because I knew the bear would, 
it was going to go for one of us. He won't go for both of us. If he goes for Tom, I'm going to get him. But if he comes for me, Tom will get him. So I was thinking about making sure I killed the bear before I got to, Ted, to, to Tom. As it turned out, it was nothing. But that's, that's engaging it. I don't know if I'm answering your question. That's, a, that's inexplicable. You can't explain that to somebody. That feeling, that is not hiking in the woods. That's entering into the predatory, pre, uh, 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 pre, uh, the predatory continuum. And you go from predator to prey to prey to predator. It's just a constant motion. That's what it is to recover that experience of the wild. Hawthorne, not Hawthorne, I keep calling him. Thoreau said, wildness is the hope of the world. Wildness is the hope of the world. He's right. But you can find it in your backyard. I had a hawk right over my head right over here a couple of days ago. Even Lily was checking them out, okay? But you've got to be silent. You've got to let the wilderness speak to you. And the hunter does that. Your hiker can do it too. But the hunter does it even more intensely because the hunter intends to engage it, not walk through it. And more than the artist, the photographer. Photographer leaves what he found. The hunter makes a difference when he, when he walks through it because he will take life, okay? The photographer won't and the hiker won't. But the hunter will. The hunter is more immediately intimate to the wilderness, to the wild, than either the artist or the or the hiker, because he's engaged and will make a difference. Isn't that neat? Yeah, he don't make a difference in a grocery store. <laughs> when people kill the weeds in their garden in order to save their flowers, or when people kill the coyotes on their property in order to save the deer. Aren't people playing God? Isn't that bad? We neuter and spay dogs and cats. Aren't we just trying to control everything? Is population control and hunting just other examples of man trying to control and be like God? That's a great question. That's the difference between what I would call, it's a true story, okay? It's a great debate between what they call preservationism versus conservationism. Whatever else is true, the human community cannot be indifferent to the environment, cannot be indifferent to the, to the animal community. We impact, our footprint is just too massive. And we learned over the last 130 years, 100, man, pushing 150 years, 1870 or so, around that time, we began to begin what we technically call the conservation movement. It was parallel to John Muir's preservationist movement. And you can have preservationism, which means no mitondry, you don't touch anything, okay? But we found that the, that, the, that the wilderness or the land uh, cannot be preserved indifferently in a preservationist sense because it impacts too many other places and other places impact upon it. You can, in, if in a primal wilderness, I think northern Alaska may be the last place in this continent where you can have preservationism. Why? Because it is so wild with natural predation, okay? that the basic cycles of predation and growth will balance themselves out, okay? The vast majority of America, however, has too much human footprint, and therefore we're impacting the land, we're impacting it. Our agriculture is impacting it. So you can't, you've got to conserve it, and conserving it means you manage the wilderness, you manage the wild kingdom, and the way we learned beginning with Theodore Roosevelt in 1887, it was one of the roles of Boone and Crockett, was how to manage those herds. And we learned that we needed to have predation. An example now. We tried, one of the things they tried to do, in order, in order to, to recover the caribou up in the north, the mule deer, in the, the, especially the Rocky Mountain mule deer, etc., to destroy all predators. They wanted to recover it, so they wanted they let the they got rid of the predators. They shot the wolves, the wolves and lions. All of a sudden, the, pre, the deer herd exploded inside and died off by starvation, overpopulated, and they died off. Okay, now you, I don't think there's ever been recovery of the Rocky Mountain mule deer. It was a unique species that evolved over tens of thousands of years in that terrain. Okay, so we learned we had to we we had to to allow predation to a degree. We, didn't, we learned by doing it, by managing it, okay? We managed by doing and learning. So we know that if you want to bring the number of 
prevent starvation through disease of, let's say, wild, wild, wild uh, white-tailed deer, you've got to bring the population under control in such a view notice it, it, that it fits the habitat. All right, you could reintroduce the wolf to do that, do a thorough job, but the wolves can eat your cows too. So it doesn't work as, as nicely as you would like as it could in Alaska. You don't need to, 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 to call the, the, the herd, the caribou herd, the wolf will do it for you, okay? But what are you going to do with the white-tailed deer? We have too many deer in the state of Missouri now, and the danger of that is disease. And we don't have sufficient natural predation. Therefore, in order to conserve the, the species, we have to manage it by action. We have, and the action is normally and most efficiently hunting. It's, it's a proven over, over, under, over 100 years now of practice, learning by doing, that hunting is the best way to conserve certain key species. Also, the reintroduction of, of uh, predators. So I'm glad the wolf is coming back, the mountain lion is coming back, okay? The bears are coming back in these states. Okay? Throughout the country, actually. But even there, there's going to require management because we have to conserve it and we learn, we conserve through learning and practice. Your, your, your uh, conservation corps are constantly learning. Um, you can't eliminate both the human imprint and the fact that urbanization and structural changes in the overall structure of the, of the biotic community. You can't leave it alone. You have to manage it or it will self-destruct. We know that by excessive animal reproduction, they'll reproduce themselves to a starvation level, especially deer. And they'll wreak havoc on trees and a number of other things. You've got to manage You have no choice. You have to manage it. You say, well, let's reintroduce the uh, mountain lion. I'm game. Okay, but your cats are going to get eaten first. And your dogs are not going to be able to go out. When I was in Montana, I gave a perfect example. I was staying with this guy, and, his, and, his, and he, had his, he had his dogs. I guess it was dogs were in the house, crapping in the house and all. And I said, the hell you, why don't you let your dogs out? He said he had a mountain lion work in the yard. And so the mountain lion climbs up a tree right in front of his back window. His tail's hanging down. He's waiting for the dogs to come out. Why? You can eat them. See? So you can't, once you want the mountain lion, I'm game, I'd love to see mountain lions come back in Missouri. However, oh, Lily over here is not going out for a walk, okay? Because she's gonna, she's easy, yeah, you are though. You're easy picking, you see? Your cats are gone with the wind, they wouldn't have a prayer, okay? Look at when you introduce the eagles. The eagles are gonna come swooping in. They see a cat, they'll go, okay, woof, the wound it up, boof, goodbye, okay? So you can, you can say, let's bring back the predator. Yeah, you can. You bring him back. But guess what? He's going to prey on easy prey. And we, we neuter our pets. Lily's been neutered and all the rest are spayed. And the reason is reproduction of a, a pets has got to be responsible. Or else you're throwing a huge population out there. We are not free not to manage. Our footprint is too large. If you leave it just motivationally, it won't work. We know that. There's two kinds of people, the kind that eat meat and the kind that don't. Amongst the kinds that eat meat, there are those who are never willing to go and hunt or fish or trap, but they go to the store and they buy the meat and they eat the meat. On the other hand, amongst the meat eaters, there are the kind that hunt and harvest their meat in order to consume it. Then. There are those who don't eat meat, vegetarians and vegans. They eat other things, not causing harm to an animal by, for example, shooting it with an arrow or a bullet or grabbing it with a hook. Is one kind of person more criticizable and less immoral than the other? I don't want to blame anybody, okay? I recognize that if you've never done it, okay? If you've never been into that intimate relationship, you're not going to understand it. And so it's going to look like sheer hypocrisy on your part, okay? Or you're going to see there's something incoherent or inconsistent. Well, the truth is it is not. It's two different ways of der deriving different your nourishment. In one case, it's purely food. That is the grocery store. The other is spiritual food. It's both spiritual and food, okay? You're not only feeding the body, you're feeding the spirit because you're recovering your relationship to the wild community. 
You see that? You don't get that at, at the grocery store. So you can have all year long, you can eat uh, your steaks and whatever, whatever from the grocery store and then shoot a deer and, or partridge or pheasant or whatever it may be. And instead of eating chicken, then I eat a partridge. The difference is, or you eat a pheasant or a rabbit or squirrel because that it is a different food. It has a different intimacy to you, the consumer, the consumer hunter, as opposed to the consumer consumer. And the industry, the, the agricultural industry, is to separate you from the, f the food process, the food, the food source, okay? Whether it's vegetables, whatever it may be. Even if you're a vegetarian, you go, all you gotta do is drive to the state you're living in, Illinois, and you see massive farms, okay? Do you have to go to that farm to make sure, you know, for, to get your bread? No. We live, we're urbanized for the last, especially a couple hundred years. Here in America, but talk about Western culture. We've been, uh, we've been urbanized for 6,000 years. We have been drawing our nourishment basically through agriculture, not through personal uh, acquiring. So it's normal. It would be, I don't want to criticize anybody. It'd be, it's short-sighted and uninformed and it's unwise for them to criticize the hunter unless they think the hunter is enjoying a pleasure. It's just fun. God, let's go kill something, okay? There isn't a hunter can breathe can say that. They will say that. There is, a, there is a terrible sense of grief and sadness in the taking of an animal's life. Um, you do see some people standing over them in a sense of, I saw it when I was a boy, we stood over the animals we shot. We kill a rabbit, you think we kill a con, you know, like, boy, that's the boy, okay? This is the boy, the triumphalism of a boy, but look at a mature male, a hunter, a female hunter, and watch the body language with regard to a dead animal how gentle it is, okay? Reverential. Is the, is the, using the notion of pain as a decisive issue is not the decisive issue. The decisive issue is life and death, not pain. The natural, the, the animal suffers pain, that's part of its evolutionary excellence. That's why it can respond, okay? You, so an animal responds to its environment through pain. You're going to have to take away rain, snow, sleet, and ice to say that, okay? But that's why he, that animal survives, because it copes with pain. Co pain is not, uh, is not in and of itself an evil. You're right about vegetarianism and veganism, but it isn't based on pain. It's based upon the taking of life unnecessarily. If we can live vegan lives, then why take the life of an animal if you don't have to? You see that? It's not the pain. And the ethics of hunting is really crucial is to inflict the least amount of pain. Hence, there's a moral mandate to a hunter to practice the use of the weapon in such a manner that you get it, what they call technically a clean kill. And that doesn't mean, it means fancy, it means you kill him almost instantly. And a bear, I don't know about a, um, I don't know about a, um, a deer, the, the speed. But if you're a hunter, what you shoot as the lungs, okay? You always aim at the lungs. There's two reasons for it. It's an easy target, and it's a lethal target. And a bear, if you shoot a bear in the lungs, that bear will be dead within seven seconds, okay? Seven seconds, you'll stop breathing. We know that, okay? I assume the same of a deer. So a lung shot is not painful. In fact, most likely, the animal doesn't know it's been shot. It just stops breathing. Uh, boy, there's so much. Ah, uh, be surprised. The bullet goes through him, right through, don't even know it. it. Probably a bee sting would be hurt him even more, okay? It's just you see him cease to breathe and then topple over, okay? So it's not pain. The legitimacy of the hunt is whether you have sufficient reason to take the animal's life and do so with the least amount of pain. That is, you don't wantonly wound them. For me, the thing was so hard for me is that I didn't kill that buck with the first shot and then he was suffering. That was gruesome for me because now I am inflicting pain on him and I tried to kill him as fast as I could at that moment to take him out of his pain and his fear, okay? I had a legitimate right to take his life but not to inflict unnecessary pain on him. That's the ethics of a hunt, okay? That's very much it. I'll give you an example. We've talked to my friends and I, they're bow hunters, okay? The guy passed up on a huge buck up in Wisconsin last week. This guy's one of the finest hunters I ever know. Unbelievably good hunter. 
the buck, the buck was about 65 yards away. He used a crossbow. He felt it was 15 yards past what he could say a sure shot. He let him go. He never took a, he never took a deer. Okay, that's ethics. I couldn't tell you how many times I've passed on the shot because the animal didn't give me a shot. A couple, not this one, the year before, I had a buck right on the edge of a tree. All he had to do was turn three feet this way. He's about 70, 100 yards away from me. I had a simple, easy shot with a rifle. All I had to do was move. I know the length of range. I, I know I'm good to 150 yards if I can rest the rifle. I've got to be able to rest it so I'm not wavering it. All right? They wouldn't turn. I could have shot him and knocked him down and then pumped a second round. Won't do it. Wouldn't do it. He walked away. I never saw him. That was Saturday. I hunted the rest of the week. Never saw him again. Never took a deer. That's an ethical shot. Because I can't, you can never wound wantingly. It always has to be the clean kill. All right? So if I'm a vegan, and we got colleagues of mine are vegans and vegetarians, the argument is not pain. The argument is the taking of the life, in their view, unnecessarily. In my view, I counter that by saying this is an immediate entrance into the predatory prey relationship. And that atavistic experience is sufficiently great, warrants the taking of the life, overtaking of a photograph. Because I enter into the taking of the life. I am acting in a predatory manner, which we all are. Even the vegetarian is a predator, just doesn't know it, does the other guys doing the harvesting. You say, okay, just cutting down trees, just cutting down a grain. Yeah? Ask all the birds that don't eat there. Ask all the rabbits that have been not. Where are the deer? Where's all that? They've been run out. Don't tell me there's no influence, there's no impact. The hell there isn't. It's huge. And in the state of Illinois, and I go to where my boat is out in eastern Illinois, you go for mile after mile after mile of fenceless fields. Okay? They've improved. Now they don't turn it over until the, to the spring. And so they're leaving it out there and they're leaving hedgerows. If not, those are dead, those are dead entities. You want to see the, a destruction of wildlife, go to a farm, a clean crop farm, that turns it over in the fall. Nothing can live there. Am I right? Nothing can live there. That's not, you say, well, it's, they're vegetarian, so crap and what? You wiped out a hell of a lot more than a hunter with a shotgun shooting a few birds. A hell of a lot more. You've destroyed a species in that area. You wiped them out. Okay? The best looking farms in the world have got growth. <laughs> Hedgerows, all that. That's where the birds are. That's where the, the, ground, the ground birds are, the, the, the nesting birds. Okay? Yeah. If you want the wild kingdom, you've got to leave it wild. So you don't want clean crop farming. Even though you save money if it's going, if when you go to the grocery store, if they have clean crop farming, the food's going to cost you less. They get more per acre, per acre. But the wild kingdom suffers. No hunter impacts the wild kingdom the way clean crop farming does and did. Nobody does. You want to kill farming? You want to kill wild animals? Put up a subdivision. Put it up. You'll destroy everything around you. You want to make it worse? Rather than hunting an animal, feed a wild animal. Start feeding him. If he doesn't die of the food you gave him, you took away his wild instincts, his fear, and his shyness. That animal's going to get run over by a truck or a car. It's going to end up, if it's a bear, it's going to end up eating in your garbage can, and then the guy's got to come out and kill it. Well, you know, mind your own effing business. Leave him alone. Not a pet. Leave him wild. The destruction of the wild kingdom didn't come from the hunter. The hunter is the guy who saved it. The wild kingdom was destroyed by urbanization and spreading urbanization and agricultural techniques. God, what's worse than the fertilizers that we use and uh, DDT and all the rest? It wiped out bird species all over the place. But by God, your bread didn't cost you as much. So don't give me that. That's just the truth. There's where you stay. You either get to no more, or, then you're, or else you're in a borderline. There you're getting close to being hypocritical, okay? Because don't tell me you're not a killer because you're a vegetarian. You are a killer just indirectly. The very fact you eat, you kill. The only difference is who pulled the trigger. That's all. I mean that. Even a vegetarian. If we went to a complete vegetarian diet, you'd wipe out most of the wild kingdom. Because <laughs> you got to grow it. You're going to crowd them out of his natural habitat, okay? How do you decide what animals you want to hunt? There's a couple of answers to that. One is availability. So if I'm in Missouri, I want a deer hunt, okay? 
I used a turkey hunt, unsuccessfully, but I used a turkey hunt. It's a great state, probably the best state in America for turkey hunting, actually, okay, and deer hunting. And I used to small game hunt a lot of rabbits, squirrels, birds. When I had bird dogs back in Kentucky, I used to do that. I think what, I think whatever, I think it's whatever, whatever animals are first of all legal and they're whatever animals are indigenous to the habitat, to the culture. I would never hunt an animal that is, I would never hunt an animal that's been artificially put there. I did it one time in Tennessee and never do it again. I hunted a wild boar. I, if the wild boar was truly wild, it would be different, but it wasn't. It was canned. It was a canned hunt. I'd never do it again. Never. So deer, because the native animals in this area are deer, uh, uh, North of the river in Missouri, you've got uh, bird hunting, small game. But they are, for me here, deer. If the bear population were to expand sufficiently, okay, then, and in natural, it's obviously not been stocked. They emigrated up from, from Arkansas. And if I were to draw a tag, I'm going to probably say, I'd like to take a trick a shot. I'm going to see if I can get a bear, okay? I hunt the big game because. It draws me so intimately into the experience. The one trouble with small game hunting, rabbits, squirrels, and birds, you don't establish that, that immediate total connection with the game that's hunted. You hunt a deer that's as big as you are, or a bear, there is an immediate sense in which they are, in a sense, they are co-equal. There is a sense in which you, you feel the magnitude of the action you've performed, that you are taking the light. When you shoot a squirrel, it's not as obvious. It is true but it's not as obvious. Ask me if I could shoot a squirrel now. I don't think I could, okay? All right? But I worked my way to that experience by way of big game, big game hunting. Big game hunting in a sense, big game meaning large predator hunting or deer or elk or anything that brings out your maximum skills and your maximum intimacy with the wild kingdom. I like to hunt deer and bears because it creates an intimacy, a much more intensive intimacy between me and the hunter. That's why I do it. Not taking away from the others. Sure and hell shot more squirrels and rabbits than I ever did deer. Okay, and, and that makes, when my grandmother made the sauce, that was the best, oh my God, you wanted the best Italian sauce to eat it with squirrels and rabbits. Holy cow. That was a festa. It was a Monday night. My dad was a waiter in a restaurant, so the only night off he had in the week was Monday. And he'd go hunting. And those nights, we would eat the rabbits with polenta, or with, but mostly polenta with this red sauce. Holy God, was it good. And sometimes, because it was shot with the BBs, okay, shaka? While you're eating, while you're eating it, the BBs will get stuck in your teeth. It was all part of the ritual. Those are sacred times. Those are sacred moments. You never forget them. I'm grateful for my father. He taught me to learn to, learn to love to walk the wild, to fish and hunt. Never take it more than you need and never do anything wantonly. Never kill for its own sake. That's neat, isn't it? It's in my blood. And if I had children, that's what I would have done. I would have wanted to take them out so they could choose, but they're not going to choose foolishly. They're going to choose wisely from within. If they, I'm going to tell you this, I have a line somewhere, one of the things I wrote. I said, if you don't love them, you can't kill them. There's an intimacy between the hunter and the hunted, the prey, predator and the prey. If you don't love the animal you're hunting, you have no right to take its life. It will give you its life if you love him. If you love her, it will not. If you don't, it won't. As I say up in Alaska, in, the, in broad terms, not just the animals, but the wilderness, if you don't love and respect the wilderness, she won't forgive you. And I take that seriously.